We're learning more tonight about the victims in last week's deadly gas lamp shooting. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Carlo Chiquetto. I'm Marcella Lee and for Barbara Lee Edwards. Five people were shot on Thursday night, including one man who died. The accused gunman was tackled by Good Samaritans before police arrived. News 8's Shannon Handy has more on how the survivors are doing and the gunman's criminal past. San Diego police say the gunman shot and killed valet Justice Bolden outside the Pendry here, then continued up fifth where he shot four additional men. Three of them were visiting from New Jersey. The fourth, a retired local teacher on his way to see his son perform. He was coming to my show and he didn't make it to my show walking from his car to the venue. News 8 spoke with Stephen Eli's son on Friday, just one day after the 68-year-old was shot in the torso. On Monday, Stephen's wife, Linda, told News 8, Stephen is in the trauma ICU area at UCSD Medical Center in Hillcrest. He has had two surgeries so far. A lot of organs were affected by the wound. If all goes well, he will be out of the hospital in two weeks. I'm thankful to all those people for their bravery and courage who helped save him. Doctors say the bullet will stain him after he heals. It is safer not to remove it. He is a retired teacher from the Poway District. Stephen was one of five people shot Thursday night in San Diego's Gas Lamp District. He was walking near a group of men from New Jersey who were also hit. 27-year-old Vincent Gazzani has gunshot wounds to his upper body and is listed in stable condition at UCSD. His dad tells Zuzi he is doing better and we are focused on him right now. 26-year-old Alexander Ballas was shot in the arm but has since been released from the hospital. By phone, he said he wasn't ready to talk about what happened and is already back in New Jersey. 28-year-old Jatil Kodati, also from New Jersey, was treated on the scene for a gunshot wound to the arm. Sadly, the fifth victim, Justice Bolden, did not survive. Bolden was working as an ace parking valet at the Pendry Hotel when he was shot and killed. His best so, friend says the 28-year-old uh, recently got the job to help pay for his dream of becoming a pilot. It told me he was the happiest and most optimistic he'd ever been in his life. He felt like he was really on you know, where he wanted to be and had a, a true passion to learn uh, about becoming a pilot and was really excited about that and uh, you know, felt like he was really taking the, uh, the next step in life. Investigators aren't sure why the gunman, 32-year-old Travis Oreshte, a downtown resident, shot Bolden unprovoked before walking down the street and firing even more shots. According to Police Chief David Nislight, Good Samaritans tackled him and pinned him down before police arrived, but he refused to provide a statement. Court records show Oreshte has an active misdemeanor warrant for his arrest in San Diego County for operating as a security guard without a license. He's also on probation in San Diego County for a 2019 misdemeanor conviction of carrying a concealed weapon and has several misdemeanor traffic citations out of Ohio. The gunman is being held without bail. His arraignment is scheduled for next Monday. All right, Shannon, thanks. The organizers behind a recall effort against Governor Gavin Newsom have collected enough valid signatures to trigger a special election. The California Secretary of State's office says it has verified more than 1.6 million signatures, 100,000 more than needed. An election is likely to happen this fall. Local researchers have discovered 27,000 barrels of potentially toxic material off the coast of Southern California. Researchers with UC San Diego mapped the seafloor and made the discovery in a former DDT dumping ground. News 8's Brandon Lewis looks at the findings and how the barrels got there. At Carlo and Marcelo, those barrels were placed there decades ago and were only recently found. We didn't know the extent of the issue until local researchers went out and had a look. San Diego researchers spent two weeks in the San Pedro Basin near South Catalina. It's an area twice the size of Manhattan that was once a dumping ground for toxic material like DDT. It's important for the public to, to realize that it's not just barrels associated with the Montrose Chemical Corporation and you know, potential DDT within those barrels, but a wide, there was a wide range of dumping that occurred here in the LA Basin. And as I mentioned, it began in the 30s. The dumping continued for 40 years, and no one really knows what's left behind or the impact it's having on the environment. In fact, just counting and mapping the barrels thousands of feet below the surface is a technological marvel. In total, we detected over 100,000 targets, and we were able to classify 27,000 of those as barrel-like. We have a high degree of confidence that these are indeed barrels. And then over 100,000 other debris targets. So we just didn't feel confident calling it a barrel, but it's clearly man-made. Other teams will start with the confirmed items and eventually take samples. We need to measure and assess the conditions of the barrels, find out if they're no longer containing what might have been discharged in them, 
and begin taking samples to do chemical analysis. From there, other teams can consider removal or cleanup, and some can look at studying how it's impacted marine life, including bottlenose dolphins that were found with high levels of DDT back in 2015. There are also more places to search for these barrels, meaning these 100,000 targets may be only the beginning. We were very surprised at the extent of them and over what length of them. But you know, looking at the historical records, how this had potentially occurred for decades on a monthly basis, it shouldn't have been a surprise to us, but it was still just not anything I had really uh, wrapped my head around in terms of envisioning what we might actually find. There's still a lot of ongoing research that needs to happen, including just how big of an impact this has had on the marine life that calls that area home. Carlo and Marcella. All right, well, we definitely were talking about rain all week on long, and we picked some up here in San Diego. In fact, we saw a good amount of rain come down in Santee over 3,100. It's up in the mountains over a quarter of an inch. And as you look across the county, basically a tenth of an inch in some of the higher locations with two 100s in Carlsbad as well as downtown San Diego. But there is a big warm up on the way here in San Diego. We've cooled off from our daytime highs into the low to mid 50s inland. But boy, up in the mountains, it's chilly. Check it. The temperature change though over the next three days from 63 tomorrow to a 78 on Thursday and it's going to get even warmer on Friday 77 on Wednesday 88 in those inland microclimates on Thursday. Get ready for some warm weather after some cool wet conditions. That's a look at our weather for now. I'll have your eight day microclimate forecast in just a bit. All right, Sean, looking forward to the warm up. Thanks. Today, the San Diego City Council unanimously approved an independent committee to review police practices. This comes nearly one year after mass protests around the nation demanded changes to the current structure of police departments. This passage of the committee comes from Measure B, a citywide proposal passed by voters last year to provide an independent review of police practices in San Diego. A woman killed in the East Village is being remembered tonight. Police say she was killed last night when an apparently suicidal man jumped from a parking structure near 10th and J and landed on top of her. Friends are paying tribute to Taylor Colley. Online and a memorial is growing on the site in the East Village where she died. The man who jumped from the structure was later pronounced dead at a local hospital. We'll have much more on the story coming up tonight on News 8 at 10 on the CW San Diego and on News 8 at 11. Two men who pleaded guilty to attacking a Black Lives Matter protest in Imperial Beach last summer will not be spending any time behind bars. Today, 39-year-old Jeffrey Brooks and 33-year-old Henry Brooks Jr. were sentenced to probation for their roles in the June 7th crime. In addition to hate crime charges, Jeffrey Brooks pleaded guilty to felony assault for sucker punching black journalist Marcus Boyden in the head and knocking him to the ground. Boyden was filming the protest. But get this, Boyden advocated against prison time for both defendants, telling the judge he preferred that they get counseling instead. A preliminary hearing continued today to determine if a woman from Valley Center convicted of killing her husband more than two decades ago will face a retrial. Jane Dorotick's sentence of 25 years to life in prison was overturned last summer because of new DNA evidence. But the DA's office is once again pursuing a murder case against Dorotic, who is now 73 years old. The preliminary hearing could last up to two weeks. A new book is out detailing the death of Rebecca Zahau, nearly 10 years after she was reported hanging at the Spreckles Mansion in Coronado. News 8's David Gopperson interviewed the author, who did extensive research into the controversial case. Death on Ocean Boulevard, inside the Coronado Mansion case. True crime author Caitlin Rother takes the deepest dive ever into the death of Rebecca Zahau in her new 368-page book, Death on Ocean Boulevard. The author spent five weeks in court in 2018 when a civil jury found Adam Shacknight liable for the death of his brother's girlfriend at the Spreckles Mansion in 2011. Did Adam Shacknight touch Rebecca Zahau? before Rebecca's house death with the intent to harm her? 
The answer is yes. Rother interviewed Zahao's billionaire boyfriend, Jonah Shacknight, eight times and poured over thousands of pages of investigative reports. But despite her in-depth research, she's still undecided on whether it was suicide or murder. I'm not sure that we'll ever know, honestly. I mean, I, I went back and forth the whole time that I was investigating this book, and I would be, you know, never 100% sure either way. After a seven-week investigation, Sheriff Bill Gore ruled Zahao's death a suicide, a manner of death the author, Caitlin Rother, is all too familiar with. My husband not only killed himself, he c killed himself by hanging. In her book, Rother explores why Zahao may have been distraught after learning her boyfriend's six-year-old son, Max, was essentially brain dead following his fall from a second floor banister inside the mansion while Zahao was babysitting him. And according to the author, Zahao was molested as a child and she once faked her own kidnapping in order to break up with an old boyfriend. The more I learned about her and her past, the more I started to see some parallels between her and my husband. And I'm not saying, you know, that I think she committed suicide. I'm just saying I think it's possible. Rother also interviewed Adam Shacknai, who she discovered had taken Ambien on the night Zahao died. He would just say weird things. That At one point, the author felt threatened herself by a series of text messages Adam Shacknai was sending her. They're just rants. And he would sometimes, you know, eventually direct those at me and it was not pleasant <laughs> i wouldn't waste my time killing rebecca zahow i never touched her adam shack Nye was the only person at the mansion the night zahow died he called 911 to report she was hanging naked hands and feet bound with rope and a t-shirt stuffed in her mouth in her book rother questions the sheriff's investigation of adam shack Nye. why didn't they take adam's phone why didn't they look at his phone records why didn't they you know see where he was because they do that in most cases right just to to back up somebody's story just to even confirm that he's telling the truth and they never did that the zahao family still believes rebecca was murdered they want the case reopened i think this case could be reopened if sheriff gore steps down or gets beaten in the next election david godfordson news eight the Zahao family filed a new lawsuit last year seeking more investigative records from the sheriff's department. A hearing is set for July.